take your Bible this morning and open up to the book of John chapter 12. Lord willing, we're going to look at several verses this morning, so if you'll follow along in your Bible, because we have several that I'm going to turn to, just, just look at what we're going to be looking at to see what we're going to see this morning. John chapter 12, the passage that we're going to pick up reading is, begins in verse 17. At this point in the ministry of Jesus, people have heard of the miracles that he performs. We're particularly going to pick up where some of the people that were there whenever he called Lazarus out of the grave and uh, saw that particular miracle. And so there are some that's pursuing Jesus for a, a, a very, various different reasons here. So let's pick up in verse 17 and read on down from there. It says in John 12, 17, The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye, shall, how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. That's what I'm after for us to look at this morning. The ministry of Jesus is such that his popularity, his, his, his witness, his testimony has gone out to a large multitude of people. The Pharisees, they don't like it, and so they've tried to stop it, and they've tried to thwart the ministry of Jesus, and so they're upset at different times because he still has this free reign to go about and to preach. There are some who are, who are seeking him just because they've heard of these miracles, and they may have ulterior motives or whatever, for whatever reason, they're, they're after Jesus Christ. And there are some who are in sincerity pursuing, and I believe that's what we see when we look in verse 21 of these Greeks. It says, The same came therefore to Philip, which is of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, this is what they said, Sir, we would see Jesus. In our time together this morning, I just want us to evaluate that particular comment, that request on the part of these individuals, Sir, we would see Jesus. Jesus. <clears throat> we seek after many things over the course of the day and on Sunday we gather together in church and we're seeking after many things even while we gather here in the church. And I pray that you would just turn your thoughts this morning with that phrase right there that we would all be unified in our pursuit that Amen. sir we would come together to see Jesus this morning. Amen. It's not anything else that can satisfy our life. There is no one else that can satisfy our life. There's no other promise that can be made than the promise that's as sure as it is in Christ Jesus. There is no one else who can do what he's done for us as a people of God. There is no greater God. There is no greater Lord. There is no better king. There is no better covenant than what's found in Christ Jesus. And so we can lay all things else aside, all the other troubles and the cares and the distractions and the problems of this world, because there is no answer to those things outside of Jesus Christ. We unify under that same comment, sir, we would see Jesus. And I want to question for us this morning and look at what are we asking when we say we would see Jesus? What is it that we're pursuing? Jesus asks a similar question to that of Peter and the other apostles. Let's turn to that passage. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Some say, well, we back up to verse 13 because it's where Jesus asked the question. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? That's a more intimate question. He's getting more to the heart of the condition here with Simon, or with the apostles. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And a Peter answer right there in his response to who he's, he's saying Jesus is. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Amen. Who did Peter say that Jesus is? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, Jesus tells that he celebrates what Peter says, and he says, Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. My Father which is in heaven, He's the one who has revealed, and it's upon this truth 
that Christ is, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is upon that truth that the church is built. And the gates of hell will not prevail against that. And so, sir, we would see Jesus this morning in that we would see him and understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. What does that mean for us? It means that he, if from the we go all the way back before the foundation of the world, the plans that God put in place. And we see it promised in, in uh, Genesis chapter 3 even. Genesis chapter 1 is there and 2 is there and 3 is there. In verse 3 we see mankind fall and sin and, and walk away from God. And yet God says in his providence and in his goodness, I've got my promised seed and he's going to bruise the head of Satan. He's going to step on and destroy Satan. And Satan will bruise his heel. From the beginning... God has made a promise that a Messiah was coming. We desire not just to see some other man. We don't desire just to see some other. John the Baptist was a good man, greatest outside of the kingdom of heaven, God, Jesus himself proclaims. Jeremiah was a great prophet. Elijah was a great prophet. But they hold nothing when it comes to Jesus Christ. Amen. Because Jesus is the Christ, the promised one, from before the foundation of the world that would come at the set appointed time that God sent him into this world. The way that he would send him into this world. Born as a, a baby into nothing, coming out of the portals of heaven and all the riches of glory and yet being born and laid in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes in the humblest of kind of births, without a home and without a place to dwell. That's our Messiah that came into this world. And it was by his choice it was by purpose and design, it wasn't by mistake, that our King would come as the Messiah, as the Christ, the only true begotten Son of our Lord and Father. Thou art the Christ. That word Christ means something for us. So when we would see Jesus, we're not asking us to see any man, we're asking to see the Messiah, the promise. I'd love to preach a series on the promised seed and how God, if he ever blesses me to, how God takes that promised seed and carries it all the way to Christ. And he's still alive to this day. I want you to understand that. He is the Christ. And he's the son of the living God. He is the son of God himself. Born of a virgin. Not without, he, he has no natural biological father. Joseph wasn't his natural father like we understand fathers today. The Holy Spirit is what moved in Mary and Jesus was conceived and he was conceived at the perfect will and plan of God himself. It's God's only begotten son. And it's a per he is a perfect son given as a perfect sacrifice to perfect the church that we might be with him in all of perfection. We don't just ask to see some other man. We, we say, sir, we would see Jesus Christ, this Messiah, the Christ. Go to Matthew chapter 24. The reason I, I say that a couple of times is because of what it says here in Matthew 24. We'll start in verse 5 and then I'm going to jump down and read verse 23 and I'm going to read these together. Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 5, it says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And then go down to verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. I go to these two verses to say, brethren, I don't think that we're easily deceived here in this congregation of, of, um, of believers, but there are the antichrists in this world who will deceive and will lead us astray and say, come, follow me. Follow me and I'll, I'll take you where you need to go. Do what I tell you to do and, and it'll help you. I've got promises that I can make to you and every single one of those promises or any kind of place that they, they lead you to, it's always going to fall short because they cannot deliver you and save you and bless you and uplift you and do all the things that our Lord, the Christ, truly does. So don't, don't pursue some other Christ who say that they are and, and, and the audacity of that. No, Satan doesn't come at us and say, I'm the Christ, deny the one true and follow me. He doesn't come out and say that. He says it deceptively. He gets us to follow individuals and people that make promises that are not of God. They're contrary to what God's Word even says. There are preachers and teachers today who say things using the Scripture and they distort it to fit a whole different narrative and a whole different purpose in, in your mind and your heart than what God intends and what God's Word is written for. We're not to follow after them because they are not the Christ. There's only one Christ, 
Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you see that, it's because the Father has revealed that in your hearts and your minds. And if you've tasted of that, if you've experienced the goodness of Jesus as the Christ, that's who you're here to see this morning. That's who we're here to see this morning. There's no word picture or no set of words or no way that I could cause in your mind and your heart to experience what it's like to see Jesus as the Christ. That's God who has done that for you. And there's no other reason why we could gather together as a body of believers as a church than, to, than under the truth that Jesus is the Christ. He has come and he has saved his people from their sins by dying on the cross. And we come together and we see, we desire to see Jesus in a church service or anywhere else. And our desire can be seared and genuine and good and be in earnest. And at the same time, we can come in the places where we could experience God and our desire not to be seeing Jesus. And you'll see whatever you want to see at that point, whatever your flesh desires. So we would see Jesus. And I pray we would desire to see him as the Christ. But not just the Christ. Go over to Hebrews now, Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus is the Christ. And then we're going to see a different description of him here in this passage in Hebrews chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 1 and go down through verse 4. Verse 1 says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance attained a more excellent name than they. I go to this passage whenever we look at that statement, sir, we would see Jesus, we see him in Matthew as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here we see him Found in verse three, the brightness and the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now, just consider that for a second. Seeing Jesus is to see the Father. Jesus makes that comment. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Whenever he was asked about seeing the Father, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. To see Jesus is to see God. To see Jesus is to see His glory. The glory of the Father. To see Jesus is to see the image of God Himself. And so that glory and that light and that image of God, what it's going to do for us when we see Him is it's going to bring clarity and understanding. It's going to bring a picture. It's going to bring... That glory is like no other... There's no other place that we can experience glory than in God Himself. And so when we see Jesus, we see the glory of God, and we experience the glory of God. I know I'm belaboring that point and saying it time and time again. I, I wish that I could explain it the way that it's on my heart for us to say, but brethren, we would see Jesus, we want to see the glory of our Heavenly Father, to bask and to enjoy and to experience the greatness of His goodness for us. There's another place that says it like this. Go over to Second Peter. He goes further here in, in explaining that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 is what I'm going to read in 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 16 says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They're speaking firsthand because they saw Jesus themselves. They're not speaking some tale or some story, third hand that they've heard about it. They're speaking as an eyewitness. They saw Jesus. And it says in verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. That is Jesus Christ. He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Peter and John, they saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they saw him there with Moses and with Elijah. And Peter, in seeing what he saw, he said, this is good for us to be here. They saw this, this great vision of things. And so Peter, in his limited understanding, he said, we're going to build three altars, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And that wasn't good because God said, it's not 
those that I'm pointing you to, it's Christ. And God raised up Christ for us to see Him and Him alone. And in Christ we see the glory of God. And it's in Christ that we're to worship and that alone. God is so good in that He brings us to a place to where we can see Jesus as the Christ and we can see the glory. What is the glory, brethren? It was Jesus, number one. What is the glory of God? It's all of His goodness. It's all of His truth. It's all of His promises. It's everything that, that we can't even understand. God has prepared and He has fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And so we ask to see Jesus Christ. We ask to see all of His goodness and His glory there. It's not to come before Jesus and to worship because of what we get out of it. I want to get away from that. Those distractions and those things in our mind about, well, Jesus, I need you to do this. We, we think to ourselves, well, I'm going to get busy and do what I need to be doing, and then we're going to ask for God to bless us in this work. God, I need Jesus to help me do this. That's not understanding the glory of God. To understand the glory of God says, I cannot do this. There is nothing that I can do. I can't take another step unless it starts with Jesus Christ. Well, we would see Jesus because I am not going to be able to parent or to be a husband or to be a wife or I'm not going to be able to even wake up and carry on and be the kind of Christian that I need to be today unless I see Jesus and all of his glory of who he is. Because in Christ, God has revealed to us that glory. Go to 1 Peter. We're here in 2 Peter. Back up to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, let's begin in verse 25. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So, sir, we would see Jesus. We're seeing him here in this verse as the shepherd and bishop of our souls. What is a shepherd? Someone who is taking care of. Someone who is leading and guiding and directing. What's a bishop? He's an overseer. What is the shepherd and the bishop doing in this passage of Scripture? Not just taking care of our physical needs. Our Lord does that for us. But also, He is over our souls. Why do we need a shepherd and a bishop of our souls? We're going to read this passage, but I'm going, to, I'm going to back up one verse at a time. Verse 24. Who, His own self, bear our sins in His own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Our shepherd, looking after our souls, understood that, our sin separated us from him, and so he bore our sins in himself. Verse 23, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Our shepherd endured the reviling and the buffeting and the suffering and all those kind of things for our sake. And then verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And then verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. And I know I read those, those backwards, but I think it's important to understand when we would, when we would see Jesus this morning, we, we're here to see him as our shepherd and our bishop, taking care of our souls. Why do we need someone to take care of our souls? Because we were sinners. And I used it past tense. We are sinners. But in 1 John, because of Christ. We have overcome sin. When we see Jesus for who he is, as the shepherd and bishop of our souls, he came willingly into this world, and he did what the Father told him to do, and he did it all perfectly. And he was praying one night, night, sweating as though it was drops of blood in that garden of Gethsemane. And in his humanity, he was saying, Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And in giving up that will of the flesh, Jesus Christ showed himself to us as the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. So submitting himself to that will, he endured great struggles in the flesh, great pain and great suffering. Every stripe that was went across his back, it ripped away the flesh. The shedding of his blood poured down his face from the crown of thorns that was on his head. Our Lord suffered greatly. And we would see Jesus. We need to understand and see the suffering of our Lord. We see with it his shepherding and his bishoping, his overseeing of our souls. By his stripes we are healed. 
We're not to come to Jesus lightly when we consider that. We're not to come to Jesus just because it's Sunday and it's the routine of coming to church. We're not to come to Jesus just because it's the way I was raised. I was always brought up in church. We're to come to Jesus to see him for who he really is. He is the Messiah, the one God promised from before the foundation of the world. He is the Christ. He is the glory, the express image of God himself, that we might see God in all of his wholeness and his goodness. He is the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. We deserved, we deserved those stripes and that pain and that suffering. Yet Christ took it all on his back and on his soul, on his heart and his body for us and for our sake. That's who we desire to see. We have deliverance and we have salvation and we have joy and we have peace and we have everything that we have today because of Jesus. Go to the book of John, chapter 1. There's so many things that we could point to. I had a hard time. This may feel very segmented and not tracking for you, and I understand that because when God laid that verse on my heart, sir, we would see Jesus. What, what part of Jesus do you show? When you're trying to preach that and explain that, there are so many, all from, from Genesis to Revelation, it reveals Jesus Christ to us. And, and I can't, in the flesh, I can't explain the experience of seeing Jesus to you. All I can do is remind you of who Jesus is, and I trust what God's doing in helping you um, feel and experience Jesus as you see him. John chapter 1. Look all the way down at verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He's the shepherd and the bishop of our souls, because he is also the Lamb. The sacrificial lamb that God the Father sent to die on the cross to take away the sin of the world. Now, we're going to jump to several verses here, so just bear with me. Go over to Acts chapter 8 now. Look with me in chapter 8 at verse 32. Excuse me, this is the um, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And that eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Philip reveals to him Jesus Christ. He preaches Christ to him. The eunuch, sir, I would see Jesus. But when I think about this passage of scripture that I'm reading, it doesn't make sense that God would come down and be a sacrificial lamb. In our in our finite minds, we don't see that. But that's the God that we serve. That's the Jesus that we serve. When we see Jesus, we see him going beyond what our finite minds can understand. We see the sovereignty of God in sending us Jesus Christ and that he would offer himself as a sacrificial lamb on the cross for us. And not only that, in his humiliation. And not only that, it just keeps going on down from there, things that we could say about Jesus Christ. But flip over with me to the book of Romans now. We'll keep going with that same, same line of thought as the, as the Lamb. Romans chapter 5. Here in Romans chapter 5, let's look at verses 6, beginning of verse 6 for us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That ungodly is you and I. So we would see Jesus. I want to see Jesus, the one who died for me when I was still yet in my unrighteousness. I was ungodly. Verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for, all, for that all have sinned. That's talking about Adam. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, at the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. And it goes on down. 
Verse 15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. That's a lot said there in that passage of Scripture I just read. And there's many things that we could stop and we could look at and we're seeing Jesus. We see Him. He commends His love toward us. All the way down to the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. That's you and I. This man, who was the Lamb, is Jesus Christ. He took away the sins for us. Now, sticking with that same thought, go over to chapter 7. Let's look at just verse 17 in this chapter. Verse 17 says, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me in chapter 7. We see this, this sinful nature that we have. Christ took away the sin for us, and yet we still find ourselves in this sin. Does God just leave us alone now? Jesus, sent him as the, Jesus came as the lamb to be sacrificed, but he doesn't leave us alone. Now it is, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. A wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I read that just to remind us of the struggle that we have today. Christ died on the cross for us to deliver us from sin, but we still struggle today. We still need to come together and see Jesus today. Look at that last verse now, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with, this, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. I thank God, brethren, that Jesus Christ is still at work in me today. Amen. That what I would do good, that, that confusing kind of verse there, that passage of Scripture where that struggle and that battle exists between the flesh and the spirit in me that works to want to do good, but I don't do it, I do what's evil in place of it. In that moment, in those days, in that, every day of our life, we need to see Jesus. Because it's only by the power of God through Jesus Christ. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That whenever I do anything good, I know that it was Jesus Christ. And I can't take ownership of anything good that I do. I would see Jesus today because apart from Jesus, it's just going to be evil. That's all. That's the best that I can produce. Let's go to one more passage in closing. There are many things that we could turn to to be able to see Jesus Christ. We could, see, we could turn to passages that talk about his love. And we're seeing Jesus, we see his love. Or we could turn to passages that talk about his forgiveness, and when we're seeing Jesus, we're seeing forgiveness. We could turn to passages that talk about his truth. I am the truth, Jesus says. And we could see truth and what it does for us. There, from Genesis to Revelation, God will reveal to you Jesus Christ if you'll take time to read. But I'm going to close with this passage of Scripture here, found in Matthew chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is our Savior. Yes, he has delivered us. And we like to focus on what he's delivered us from. We've been delivered from eternal hell into eternal heaven. When we see Jesus, we see him as the great deliverer, the Savior of our, our souls and our bodies, he paid it with a price, but he's delivered us. We, if we wasn't for Christ, all that we could see was hell in our distant future. But because of Christ, we no longer see hell. Death in 1 Corinthians has no rule over us. And the only way that we can see death and not fear and see hell beyond it 
is if we see Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has saved us. But Jesus also is our Savior on a daily basis. And then it goes on down here. And this is what I'm really after here. Verse 22 through 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That's the name of Jesus Christ in this passage of Scripture. And the interpretation of that name is God with us. When we see Jesus, sir, we would see Jesus is where we started out this morning. But if I can just pull these two together, sir, we would see Jesus. What we're asking for, God, I want to see you. You're here with us. Our God, brethren, is not a distant God that sits in eternal heaven that we cannot access. Our God is not a God who's so far removed from us that he doesn't understand what we're going through today. Our God is not a God who doesn't um, know our troubles and our struggles and our battles before we ever get there. He's actually going ahead of us into the battle. Our God is a God who is ever-present and right here with us. He is Emmanuel. So we would see Jesus is a request on our part that we would see God at work amongst us. We would see His glory and His goodness, that we would see His peace over us, that we would see all the things that Scripture teaches us about Jesus. But we can ask that question, brethren, because Jesus is accessible to us. He sits at the right hand of the Father, yes, but He sits right here in the pews with us as well. Where two or more gather in His name, there He is in the midst of us. Jesus is accessible to us. So for whatever that's worth this morning, to whoever, whoever of us needs that, let's go back to the question just close out with that. Let that be a request that you make today. Sir, we would see Jesus. When we walk with